Amen. That works for me. We give you all the praise and glory, God. Praise the God. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight we're kind of we're continuing in our understanding of the Holy Spirit field. And what I want to do tonight is is really kind of two teachings in one, because where I want to go eventually is where we'll have an understanding of when God said, in the day you eat thereof, or at the time you eat, you will die. And I want to have an understanding of that. And to understand that, we've got to have some background on spirit and formed, made, and created. So that's where we're going tonight. And so I want to start by just simply reading and doing a little bit of exegesis, exegesis of Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And in doing this, there's a lot of technical detail that I don't have time to get into, but uh, there, it's either in other YouTubes that we've done. And if, if you, by the way, if you're new tonight to this series, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we started a week and a half or so ago. So we've had Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday night teachings, uh, some Thursday night teachings, some Sunday morning teachings, again, another Tuesday night teaching. So uh, all of these are on YouTube. All of these are on our YouTube channel. And it's wonderful to kind of catch up. So you know where we are, where we're going, because these build on one another. So what I want to start with is I want to start, as I said, by let's see if we can exegize and understand a little about what happened in the Garden of Eden, because it's really not well understood in Christendom, um, and we want to get a better handle on it than that. And so one of the questions I want to answer is, while we do this, where did man's sin nature come from? Because it's explained in Genesis, but it's, it's hidden in a double entendre that you can't really see in the English translation. And I'm indebted to my Hebrew professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, Dr. Ken Howell, for pointing this out because it's answered a lot of questions for me. But uh, if we start in Genesis chapter 2, and we're in the creation story, if you will, and then God uh, makes Eve, and then verse 24, it's because of Eve, a man will leave his father and his mother, and then verse 25, talking about Adam and Eve, it says, they, referring to Adam and Eve, were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed, and that's important to understand. They were naked. They were not ashamed. They had no sin nature, and everything God had made was very good. Now, one of the things that we've got to remember is that when the original text was written, there were no verse breaks. There were no chapter breaks. In fact, in the original text, there weren't even breaks between the words. There weren't any spaces. There weren't any punctuation. It was just one gigantic string of letters. And so people put in the, they broke it up into individual words. Thankfully, it, it makes it a lot easier to read. Um, they put in verse numbers and they put in chapter numbers. And sometimes those are helpful and sometimes they're not. And I think here it's probably less helpful than more helpful to start chapter three. I think what we need to understand is that the context is going to go flowing right through from chapter 2, verse 25, into chapter 23, because it's, it starts in 25. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And, uh, and, the, it's, and the word naked is the word arum, which um, in the Hebrew consonant language is the, the, the ayin resh mem, uh, and that's the trilateral root. And it's important to understand that because it is translated naked in Genesis 2, the last verse, and properly so. Then verse 1 of chapter 3 starts out, now the serpent. We could probably as well understand that as but the serpent, because you had the man and his wife, Adam and Eve. They had not been exposed to evil yet. They were innocent. They were naked. They weren't ashamed. And then it introduces the serpent. But the serpent was more crafty than any animal of, of the field that Yahweh God had made. 
he said to the woman, and we learn from the context that even though the serpent spoke to the woman, the garden is small, and the text tells us that Adam and Eve were together, that Adam was with her, but he spoke to the woman. By the way, I have uh, teachings on the word serpent because he's called the serpent here, not because it's in the shape of a snake. Eve knew the animals of the field, so did Adam. They would know if a strange animal came up and started talking to them, and they would have been put off by that. So the, the, this is the devil, tells us in Corinthians 11, now the, the, the devil deceived, Satan deceived Eve. Um, Revelation 20, verse 2, he's called, the devil is called the ancient serpent. Here, uh, the devil is called a serpent because of what he does. He's crafty. Um, he goes for your head. He, he's poisonous, that kind of thing. Uh, but he would have come to the woman as a representative of God. I mean, if he's going to say, did God really say? He's going to show up in a form that Adam and Eve are not put off, but rather they're sucked in. So he says, has God really said you must not eat of any tree of the garden? And by the way, like I say, I have, I have teachings. We have teachings and YouTubes and stuff on that, as well as REB commentary, if you want more detail. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, God has said, you must not eat from it, neither must you touch it, lest you die. And one of the things we see in this, this interesting, um, because the, the manifestation we just listened to, God was saying, you know, hold my word close. And Eve didn't. God said, God said, you know, you must not eat of any fruit of the, you may freely eat of any fruit of the garden, but not the fruit in the tree of Eve, uh, in the middle of the garden, tree in the middle of the garden, and she leaves that out. She says, of the trees we may eat. She leaves out the word freely, so she's not fully appreciating what God has done. Then she adds, neither must you touch it, uh, which God said nothing about, and then lest you die, and God said you will die. So Eve did not do what the manifestation said to do tonight, hold the word close, and she's going to suffer from it. I would say if there's a mini lesson here that God spoke to us tonight to hold the word close, and we see here in Eve what happens when you don't. And once the serpent knew that Eve was loosey-goosey on the word, then he moved in more boldly. In verse, the serpent said to the woman, no, you will not die. Yes, die. In other words, that's what God said. When you eat thereof, you will die. Yes, die. So the serpent is exactly repeating what God has said, but saying no. He's saying, no, you will not die. Yes, die. For God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that is true. The word knowing here is to know more than just mentally. It's to mentally and experientially know what evil is like, what it is to experience evil. Um, and of course, that's exactly what happened. And we learn later on in the chapter, God says man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and therefore God had to expel them from the garden. By the way, it is because mankind, humankind, inherently can tell good from evil at a very, very basic level, but people inherently know good from evil. And, you know, children learn this very early. They, they, don't, they, just, they just know it, <laughs> part of their nature. Try and take a choy, toy from a child. They, they instantly know that there's something wrong with that, and they scream and cry and put up a fuss. Similar, you, you do something kind for a child, and they laugh and they smile, Humankind now knows good from evil, and that's one of the reasons that there can be a day of judgment, because on the day of judgment, people who stand in front of God's throne are going to have to give an account for how they have followed that knowledge of good and evil, which will lead them to him. And that's one of the reasons that the Bible says, if you, if you knock, if you ask, it will be opened. If you, if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, you'll get answers. That's some of where that comes from. So verse 6, and we know the story. 
Uh, she saw that the tree was good for food, which it wasn't. Another little mini lesson, we can be deceived by our five senses. It was a delight to the eyes. It was desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, verse, uh, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And that's, Adam was standing right there, and for whatever reason, and this is totally different teaching and a totally different subject about people taking responsibility for their part. Adam should have taken the responsibility here and said, Eve, cut it out. You're not eating of the fruit, and you're not giving me any either. We heard what God said. For whatever reason, Adam didn't take a stand, and we're all suffering because of it. Um, that's one of the reasons in Timothy it says the woman was deceived. She was deceived by the servant. But it says, but Adam was not deceived. Yes, Adam knew what God said and ate anyway. Verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. Um, Oh, and I, I didn't give you some, some background to this. Uh, in verse 1 of chapter 3, well, in, in the last verse of chapter 2, it said the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. And the word naked is the Hebrew word arum. As I said, you know, ayin resh maim is the, the Hebrew trilateral root. It's the word arum and it meant naked. Well, it's a homonym. It has two completely different meanings because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any animal of the field, same trilateral root, ayin resh mem. It's, and this is what my Hebrew professor pointed out to me, and I have since gone back and, of course, reaffirmed the work. But um, the point is that the word crafty and the word naked are, can be the same word in Hebrew. And that becomes very important because now they've eaten. And it says, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open. Now the promise was, if you eat of this, you'll know good and evil. Okay, they ate. Now they know good and evil. And because of that, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were a room. So wait a minute now. They knew they were a room. Well, is that they knew they were naked, or is that they knew they were crafty? And the answer is both, because they knew they were naked because they went out and made fig leaf coverings and covered themselves. But they knew they were crafty because even though they were now covered, when God showed up, the first thing they did was hide. And then when God found them and asked a question, you know, did you eat? The, the, the man, instead of saying, yes, I'm so sorry, says, well, the woman, and the woman says, the serpent, <laughs> and, and they're passing the buck, and that's the sin nature. So it was, in, it was in eating the fruit of the tree of the garden, the fruit in the midst of the tree, the, the garden of, of good and evil, the tree of good and evil, it was in eating that fruit and siding and believing the devil instead of God that in a process that is not explained and we don't understand, the devil's nature became the nature of the humans that followed him. So that when Genesis 3.1 says the serpent was more a room, more crafty, now the man and the woman have become a room. They already were naked. Now they've become crafty. And so they, they sewed the fig leaves together to cover their bodies Verse 8, they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh. And why did they do that? Not because they were naked, but because they knew they had sided with the devil and become crafty. So man, God finally called out and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was a room and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were a room? Have you eaten of the tree? And then Adam, here he passes the buck. The woman that you gave to me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree and I ate. So Adam passes the buck, Eve passes the buck. So it's very important here that we understand what's happened to Adam and Eve in this, um, uh, in this exchange. And they're 
not dead and they're not gonna die for a number of years after this. And that goes then to kind of the, the second, uh, well, the, into the second part of this teaching, which is uh, what, what died? What did God actually say? To understand that, let's go back to Genesis chapter two, and we wanna go to verse 17. And we'll back up, we'll get some context from verse 15. And it says, Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And by the way, one of the interesting things here is that this gives us an idea of how big the garden is. You know, I, 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 so many people, wow, we, we're going to go on a hunt for the Garden of Eden. And they try and look between the Euphrates and the Tigris River, but it's not, you know, I don't think it's going to be found there. But even if the Garden of Eden was found between the Tar Tigris and Euphrates River. Of course, it was totally wiped out and changed by the flood anyway. But the point is that Adam and Eve had to work the garden and take care of it. And a human being can only do that for a couple acres. So this is not some gigantic tract of land like a state in the United States or, or something like that. This is not some huge piece of land. If you thought about, okay, I'm gonna have a garden, it's good time of paradise, uh, everything grows well, there's gonna be no lack of food. Um, how, <laughs> how much land do you wanna work and guard? <laughs> and you might say, well, I think I could pull off five acres or something like that, um, you know, but it wouldn't be a very large spot of land. And that's, that's kind of important to understand if we're trying to understand the Garden of Eden story. And ver so verse 15, Adam and Eve are in the garden. God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat. Yes, eat. Um, and I, I uh, owe the translation theory to Everett Fox, who translated the Shokin Bible. Um, the figure, the technical figure of speech is polyptotin, and polyptotin is when you have two words that are the same word, um, and that, but they're either conjugated or declined differently. In this case, you have the participle eating and then the verb eat. So the, the Hebrew reads something like, so that um, in the day, uh, something like um, you... It, in, eat, in eating, to eat, you will die, something like that. Um, and so how do, you, how do you bring that forth in English? Um, and it's, you will, you will eat, you, you may eat, yes, eat. Um, in the next verse, God said, but of the tree of the knowledge, this is verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of it, for in the day you eat of it, and then the Hebrew says, dying, you will die. So it uses the same, uh, same verb. One is a participle, and I forget what form the other is in. Uh, but in any case, dying, you will die. So if Fox said the way to bring this out in the, in the English, because dying, you will die, doesn't make any sense to most of us in English. So you will die, yes, die. And so this was the, the statement that God made to Adam and Eve. And then what we what causes great difficulty and what has caused scholars literally for hundreds of years to discuss this is when God says, in the day you eat of it, you will die, and then they don't. And what's going on? And in, uh, interestingly enough, in both the Hebrew and the Greek, the phraseology in the day is ambiguous at best. For example, the Hebrew reads beth yom, um, which would, there's no the. It's in day. That's, that's basically, that's all it is, in day. And, and there's a number of places uh, in the text where it uses the same phrase. If I remember correctly, um, Gosh, let me think here. We're uh, in the day that uh, I can't remember where it is, where it says, um, how am I going to find this? Uh, let me see what I'll do. Hold on just a second. Let me go to, um, 
Uh, well, I thought I could find it pretty quickly, but um, I don't see it right off. Um, oh well, but it's a, a one of the places you can do a study of the of the phrase, and you'll find there are places where the exact same phrase is used. In this case, it's the phrase where God said, um, in the day that God created the heavens and the earth. And it's the precise same Hebrew phrase, but obviously God did not create the heavens and the earth in one 24 hour period. And in fact, in Genesis, it delineates at least six. So it's, it's saying a time frame. So the reason this becomes important then is that the the Hebrew text, if it had meant to say in that exact day, it could have. Similarly with the Greek text, if you look at the Septuagint text, and the Septuagint was translated ah, 250, 200 BC, in that area where the, the Greeks translated the Hebrew text into Greek. And once again, the Greeks could have very clearly written in the day. And instead, like the Hebrew, they used a phrase that was ambiguous, and it could mean in that day, but it doesn't have to. It could mean in a general time period. So we're, as, as readers, we're kind of left in a, a kind of a no man's land of, okay, God, something could have died that day, but if you'd want it to be clear, you could have and you weren't. So he's also allowing for the possibility that in, the, in a general time period, in that general time period, you will die. And we've got to be aware of that. And in, in being aware of that, then um, there are teachings out there that, well, God specifically said in the day, so something had to die that day. And what I want to say, first of all, is no, neither the Hebrew text nor the Greek text forces the meaning in the day. It's a possible meaning, but it's not a forced meaning. It's not the only meaning. But, but that's important to understand. And, and then going from that, then, uh, where uh, a lot of times we know that Adam and Eve did not die, so obviously their body didn't die, and their soul life didn't die. And so what gets sometimes taught is that, well, their spirit life must have died. Well, the problem with that is there's absolutely nothing in the Bible that says so. When God said in the day you eat, you will die, yes, die. He didn't say your spirit will die or a part of you will die or, or anything like that. He said you. And the fact is that you didn't die. So I want to look then at this point, I want to take a look at the word, and this is, um, take a breath. And what I want to do now is, is jump to a, a kind of a different subject that goes into what would be called loosely the anthropology of man in the Bible. What is man? How is man made? How is man designed? Because to understand this, we have to understand that um, God uses a number of different words to talk about what he did to bring man forth. And he used the word create, he used the word made, he used the word formed, he used a bunch of different words. And if we're not careful, what can happen is we can force meanings on those words that don't really apply. We can force definitions that don't really apply. And then what happens is when we, when we make up our mind about a certain definition and we force that definition into the context, then we end up, it's, it's like a circular logic. We end up with the, we expected it to mean this, we force that meaning on the text and then poof, it has that meaning. And I'll, I'll kind of give you an example of this. But as we, as we look at this, uh, I want to back up first, because if we're going to do good biblical research, all good biblical research begins with the text, which is words. And so we have to learn something about words to get this right. So 
Uh, this is pretty easy. You and I all know this. Most words have at least one definition, at least one. And boatloads of words have multiple, multiple definitions, six, eight, 10 definitions. And if you, if you read the, if you speak the language fluently, then you sort through those definitions from the time you're a kid and it, it's instinctive. You, you know, when, when somebody speaks, if somebody says, I went fishing at the bank, you don't picture them with their fishing rod standing in line in front of the bank teller, even though they said they went fishing at the bank. You just, you just oh, okay, the bank of the river, the bank of the lake. It's just, we don't, even, we don't even get the picture and have to reject it. We understand our own language so well that the, the meaning becomes apparent from the context almost instantly. Um, so words have a couple Dif de different definitions and the definition in, of a given word is determined for the most part by the context. See, we have a choice here. We can either take a word and assign it a meaning and then wedge it into the context and torque the context to fit our definition. Or we can understand what the word means in its totality. And then when we read any given context, what happens, we kind of compute instantly and figure out what meaning works. That's one of the reasons that right when I started teaching on spirit, one of the very first things we did was we went through the definitions in Appendix 6 of the REV and 15 different meanings for spirit in the Greek and Hebrew text. So if the Bible, if Jesus Christ is kicking a spirit out of somebody, we know he's not taking out the gift of Holy Spirit. We know he isn't breaking their connection with God. He's casting out a demon. And, and we, that just kind of comes up. We just understand the background and the meaning comes rather instantaneously. So the meaning of a word is determined by the context. And then, the, like I say, the, the meaning of the word doesn't force the context. The context determines the meaning of the word. Um, Let's run through a real quick one that um, if I talk about the fact that, yeah, my buddy and I went into a bar, we had a couple of drinks, we talked about life, we had a good time together, we left, um, and you get in your mind a picture of a saloon and a bar. So you, you got that, you get it. Then if I say, yeah, you know, I was, I was with my friend and it was amazing. I don't know where he got it, but my friend had a bar of gold. Okay, you don't think that there's a saloon somewhere where the bar is made of gold. You immediately process that, that, that you're talking about a, something that looks rather much like a brick. Uh, similarly, if, I, if we're in a boat and I say, you know, there's a, there's a bar around here somewhere, let's not get stuck. You're not thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm worried about you running the boat into some saloon. <laughs> you get, okay, there's a sandbar or a rock bar or something like that. Uh, and again, why am I bringing up these examples? They're easy ones, but the point is that we don't, we don't define a word and then force the word meaning into the, into the context. What we do is we learn the semantic range, that's what scholars call it, we would call it the range of meanings. We learn the semantic range of a word, and then we see what meaning fits the context. Now, how do you determine the meaning of a word? Well, the way lexicographers determine the meaning of a word is by the way it's used in the culture. And word meanings change all the time. I was taking a, <laughs> I was taking a class on the English language once, and the professor was talking about the English language and the words in the English language, and he says, he said, Words in the English language are like unruly three-year-olds. They're always running off and making new friends. <laughs> and what he was talking about was the way that word meanings change and the way word, uh, words associate in different patterns um, and that kind of thing. And so um, when we're looking at mankind then, and we're looking at God creating the world, God making the world, uh, God, God dealing with his creation, and we've got words create, we've got the word made, we've got the word formed. There's a couple other words, but those are our three big ones. Um, 
when we when we back off then and we say okay um what does create mean well how do how do the lexicographers determine what the word create means they look at all the different usages in the entire corpus of literature if you if you want to find out what an english word means you know i can't just read moby dick you know one book and then determine what the vocabulary means from that one book and the the people who assemble things like the oxford english dictionary they they literally read everything in the english language they can get their hands on how are people using words what is the definition of words the same thing goes for building the the lexicon if you will of hebrew or any other language you look at all the different usages and so create uh, to create can be to, uh, well, let's see, some of the usages of create can be to uh, shape, fashion, form by cutting, um, to, to make or create. And the emphasis of the word create, by the way, you can check this in the lexicons yourself, in the Brown Driver Briggs, uh, Briggs for example, Hebrew lexicon, they talk about the emphasis of the word create is div God's divine activity. In other words, God is going to use the word create to emphasize his role in what's going on, what, what is happening. And this becomes really important because then it helps, it informs us as to why in some verses God will say, I created the heavens and the earth. And other verses he just says, you know, um, I made the heavens and earth. And, and what's he doing there? Now the word the word make in Hebrew is a sa. Now, <laughs> that is a tough word to do a word study on. It occurs over 2,600 times in the Old Testament. <laughs> you talk about a word study that's going to take you a week. <laughs> that, that word will seriously take you a long time to study because it's used in so many different contexts. And of course, you can imagine any word that's used more than 2,600 times in the Old Testament is gonna have a huge semantic range. And, and it does, I mean, it's, it's defined more things as you can shake a stick at, do, make, work, deal with, act with effect, produce, yield, prepare, on and on and on. You can look at a good Hebrew lexicon and look it up. Big giant list of, of definitions. Bottom line with a saw to make, the emphasis is on the doing or the, the action that produces the effect. With the word create, bara, the emphasis is on this is me, God, doing it. The emphasis of asa, make, is look at what's been done. Look at the fruit, look at what's been produced, look at the effect. That's the primary emphasis. And then the other word we want to look at is, is fashion, and fashion or form is yatsar. And in fashion or form, the emphasis seems to be on the process. That with make, God can speak of something that takes a process, but the word make doesn't really refer to the process. It refers to the product. The word create can also can have a giant process, but it doesn't refer to the process or the product as much as it does to God's action in making this thing happen. And the word formed is then more on the process. Now that is not to say that sometimes God throws those definitions out the window and in poetry uses them basically parallel in parallel fashion or, or um, the syn is synonyms, that kind of thing. And this is again where we've got to be really sensitive to the context because sometimes it's very obvious that God's trying to bring forth meaning, and then other times it's just obvious that, no, God's just trying to get us to walk away with an emotional impact. Sometimes, for example, when it's used in the poetic books of Psalms or Proverbs, uh, Job is poetry. A lot of the prophets have poetic sections or their poetry that in Hebrew poetry, a lot of times God wants us to walk away with the effect. And, and, and why is this important? Well, the psalm says that, that you and I are, are wonderfully made, we're awesomely made. And I 
the, I think the more we understand about the human body and physiology and genetics and epigenetics and those things, the more we realize that whatever God did to make people, it's way over our understanding. <laughs> we, are, we are not going to be able to put God in a box. We are not going to be able to say, well, this is what this means and that's what this means. Um, you know, the, um, but the, but that's, that's really important for us to understand. Um, and so I, what I wanted to do at this point was just look at um, a couple different things to show you how these different words are played out in the scripture. Because uh, if we assign a meaning, like for example, for a long time in my life, I, uh, I was taught and I assigned the meaning that to- My apologies, whoops. I couldn't hear what you said. Excuse me, did y'all hear that? I must have said something that sounded like Siri. We so heard it. Start, oh, yeah. there it goes. Cut it out. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if, I, if I say something that sounds like S-I-R-I, -I, then my phone starts talking to me. That's not very nice. Um, but anyway, I, uh, in, in my past, I was taught that to create was to bring into existence that which had never existed before. And so I, I believed that and I took that meaning and then I tried to force it into contexts. And, and then eventually you run into contexts that it's just don't, where it just doesn't work and you're like, well, I don't, I don't understand how this can be. And it was years and years of study and, uh, and studying under professors and, and commentaries that are written by very, very wise men and women that you, you begin to have your understanding open to how biblical vocabulary works and how to become sensitive to a context. And that's one of the things that I would, would assert that if you really want to grow in your understanding of the scripture, become sensitive to the context. Just like, for example, Gen the last verse of Genesis 2 says, the man and the, and their, and the wife were both a room. Now the serpent was more a room. And you see that the juxtaposition of the word a room once used as naked, once used as crafty in a space of a half a verse. And you, and you say, okay, God did that on purpose. If you put chapter three in there, most people, you know, when they're studying, they'll like read a chapter at a time. So they read chapter two and then they'll read chapter three in another day or two. And they never see the connection that God, God made them a room, and then the serpent was a room, but it was two totally different rooms. Unfortunately, when Adam and Eve ate of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, they knew they were a room naked, and they became a room crafty. And that's the sin nature that you and I fight with today. <laughs> I, I wish I could stand here and say, after 50 years of being a Christian, I have finally beaten my sin nature. But <laughs> sadly, <laughs> it just isn't the case. The old sin nature is just around to pester you forever. So I want to start with the, the heavens and the earth. Let's take a look at the heavens and the earth. And of course, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, great place to start. And the Bible says God created heavens and earth. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is an emphasis on God, Genesis 1, 1, God is moving, God is making things happen, so God creates the heavens and the earth. Let me go forward a little bit, chapter 2, verse 4. This is the history of the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God, and you know, now that I think about it, that may be in the day. There it is, actually. That's the day I was looking for earlier. In the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. So in Genesis 1.1, he says he creates the heavens and earth. In Genesis 2.4, he says he made the earth and the heaven. What's happening here? There's a shift of emphasis from the fact that God created them to, hey, look, this is what was made. This is what was produced. So there's a shift of emphasis. And then, um, let's see, it, you know, I, I could do more, I guess. Um, Isaiah 45, 12, I have made the earth uh, in Isaiah 45, 12. Um, Isaiah 45, 18, where this is what Yahweh said, who created the heavens, the God who formed the earth. Now here's Isaiah 45, 18, 
And now we have not that God created the earth, not that God made the earth, but that God formed the earth. So now there's an emphasis more on the process, although he also pulls in the product because he says the God, this is Isaiah 45, 18, the God who formed the earth and made it, <laughs> who established it and did not create it a waste. So here in one verse, Isaiah 45, 18, you have God, the creator, the product that God made, and the fact that he had a process and he formed it. And they're all put together there in Isaiah chapter 45, 18. So, um, so what do we walk away with from these verses? You know, um, what we walk away with is that Definitely, God is the cause of the heavens and the earth. <laughs> they are here because of God. <laughs> he, he created them, made them, and formed them. And in saying he created them, there's an emphasis on his action. In saying he made them, there's an emphasis on the fact that they exist. They're the product that he made. And in saying that he formed them, he's talking about a process, which if we read Genesis chapter 1, then we get a peek into that process. And that's a, a major emphasis here in Isaiah. I mean, here, here as we, we read about the heavens and the earth. Let's talk about, um, let's shift topics. Take a breath. <sighs> Talked about the heaven and the earth. Now let's talk about animals, because we know what God said uh, in the beginning about animals. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, if you want to look at your REV there, that's where I'm going next. So Genesis 1, 21, we're going to talk about animals, and it says, and God created, so we, we see the word create here, the large sea creatures, and every living soul that moves, um, by the way, there, I'm, I'm not going to take time to expand this now, but it's taught commonly in Christianity that animals do not have a soul. It's very, um, it can be hard to see in the English versions because almost every version that you read, almost every English version that you read of Genesis 121 will read in God created something like they'll see the large sea creatures or something close to that. But they'll say, and every living creature that moves. And they'll take the Hebrew word nephesh, which is soul, and they'll make a creature and someone reading the English Bible then doesn't realize that this is a soul. And so it gets commonly taught in Christianity that animals don't have a soul. If you, um, by the way, if you're kind of a burgeoning researcher, um, one of the things you can do to see this stuff is you can get what's called a Hebrew concordance. And thanks now to the computer, there's a load of them on the internet. But a Hebrew concordance allows you to look up the Hebrew word and see all the places it's used. So if you look up the Hebrew word nephesh, which is translated soul, and you see all the places it's used, you could plug it in for yourself. For our part in the REV Bible, we have tried. It's, it's really impossible to bring out the word soul all the time because there's context in which the word soul just doesn't really fit and some of the other meanings of soul fit much better. But in, in places like this in Genesis 121, where it fits very naturally, then we bring it out. And God created the large sea creatures and every living soul that moves with which the water swarmed. And so, you know, the sea creatures have soul, the animals have soul uh, according to their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So what do we have in Genesis chapter 1, 21? We have an emphasis on God that God created all the animals. And, and that's an important emphasis, especially in today's world when so many people believe in evolution. You know, that, that, they're, you know, that, that somehow or other, uh, you, me, all the animals, everything we see around us, it's all this big accident and the product of an explosion. And, and so I think now as much as ever, it's important that we see that, no, it's God who created. God is the moving force behind there being animals and plants and people, and God created these things. And the verse ends with God saw that it was good. Then we go four verses further to Genesis 125, and it says, God made, using the Hebrew asa, made, 
the wild animals of the earth. You could go back and say, wait a minute, I thought he created them. Well, he did create them. <laughs> he made them too. They are a product. They are what he made. So God made the wild animals of the earth. And here the emphasis is not so much on God made them as God made them. There they are. Look at all those cool animals. And according to their kind and the livestock, according to their kind, and then every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind or creeps or crawls on the ground, and God saw that it was good. So here God, uh, Genesis 121, God created the animals, Genesis 125, God made the animals, uh, and, and then Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, out in this, again, Genesis 2, 19, out of the ground Yahweh God formed using the Hebrew yatsar to form every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. So here we have in the early Genesis account, we have a record of the, of the sea mammals and the sea creatures and the animals of the earth. And we have them being created by God in Genesis 121. We have them being made by God in Genesis 125. And we have them being formed by God in Genesis 2.19. And again, what we want to be sensitive to is the semantic range of those words and, and what the proper emphasis is. What is God saying? Because we're going to learn something about that. And, and, uh, and we do when we read these words in their proper context. And so then now we go to humankind. So now we've done the heavens and earth and we've done animals. So now we stop and take a breath. <laughs> Always good to kind of just collect ourselves. Where are we going now? Now let's take a look at you and me, mankind. And so uh, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And it says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make humankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So here God says, let us make. And of course, the product is going to be humans. So that makes perfect sense. Let us make this thing. <laughs> we'll call them humans. That's great. That's what we're going to do. And then verse 27 says, so God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And then it says male and female he created them. Now we know that God took part of Adam to form Eve, but here it's still God's doing, and so he created them. So in Genesis 126 and 127, we have kind of the both emphasis. We have God making humans, and God did it. He created it. And then um, the, uh, and I, I gosh, I need to say something here about image because that gets really confused. God said, let us make humankind in our image. And then in verse 27, in the image of God, he created him. And there is no end of scholarly discussion on image. Um, but really when we do the, the hard work to look at what it means to be in the image of God, then we find out that really it is because uh, in, in other places, it's going to say God made us or created us in his likeness. So being in the image of God or being in, in likeness of God is to have a lot of the same attributes that God did. So God is love and he designed people to be loving. Now we've, there's, we've got a sin nature. So now we have a problem with that. But God designed us to be loving. God wanted a family and he designed people to love families and want families. God is creative, and he designed people to be creative. God is communicative. He loves communicating and talking and communicating with his creation, and God created us to want to be in communication and to want to be in community, and God wants to be in community, and we want to be in community. There's a whole lot of what God is when you read the scripture about God is, God is love, God is light, all the ontological statements about God. And then you look at people and we're the same thing. Now, for a long time, I thought that being created in the image of God was be, to be created as a spirit. 
but there's some problems with that. One is that we're not a spirit, but number two, here's Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Now, Genesis 9, 6 is after the flood. The flood is 1,656 years after the creation of Adam. So Adam and mankind have long been fallen. And then God, you know, everybody became evil. God had to wipe out the earth with a flood. And here's Adam and Eve after the flood. And God's giving them instructions. And what kind of people are on earth? Well, fallen people, fallen mankind, fallen nature. I mean, God... They were just always so evil that he had to wipe them out with a flood. So these are not good people. And so what does God say in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6? Whoever sheds the blood of man, his blood will be shed by man. So why is it that murderers deserve the death penalty? And he says, for God made man in his own image. So even in its, in its fallen state, and this is very important to understand, in our fallen state, we are still in the image of God. We still are supposed to love. We still desire to have a family. We still want to communicate. We still want to be in community. Um, we still want to create like art and sculpture and, and that kind of stuff that, that human beings hold the image of God even in their fallen state, which is why in Genesis 9, 6, he says, why? Do people who kill deserve to be put to death? Because the people they kill are in the image of God. And so that is, is very uh, important. Um, uh, going back now to humans uh, formed, made, and created. We saw in verse 26, God said, let us make humankind. Then in verse 27 of Genesis 1, God created man. And verse 9, Genesis 9, 6, uh, God made man in his own image. And then Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the descendants of Adam in the day that God created man. So here we have God's creation, God's action. And it says he made him in God's likeness. So we were made in God's likeness. When God made humankind, he made us in the likeness of God. And then, then there's, there's more of these, Genesis 6, put before the flood. Um, then um, I wanted to still do, I still want to do formed, um, but I'll do three more verses in Ecclesiastes 7.7. 7, Behold, I have found only this, God made humankind upright. So when God made Adam and Eve, he made them to be upright. Now, that means that the way he created us, remember, he, he created us innocent. He created mankind uh, to know good, but not to have experienced evil. And he said here, when, you know, God made humankind upright, but mankind searches for many schemes. Uh, the one thing we haven't hit yet, which we will now do, is God forming man. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, uh, Yahweh, I'm sorry, 7, uh, Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So now we've seen verses that say God created man, God made man, man, man he formed man. Um, and verse 8, Yahweh God planted a garden in the east in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And so there's a process for the creating and making of man, which we know occurred. There was a process. Um, and then I want to read one more verse that I think is very important, and this is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, because a lot of times people think, well, the, the spirit has been created, right? The spirit in us has been created um, as God originally designed Adam and Eve, and, and whatever spirit is in this context it's talking about God forming the spirit. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Yahweh, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth, or foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man inside him. So even when it comes to the, the spirit that interacts within us, there's a process of formation. In, in making that spirit so that it can interact with us. So um, 
what I wanted to share and what I wanted to show in, in showing this is I want us to get away from this idea that we have a, a definition for a word and then we cram it into a context and the context will conform to that meaning. Because basically when God then said, uh, in a day you eat, you will die, couple different possibilities that seem to work. Obviously, Adam and Eve did not die that day. So one is both the Hebrew and Greek can read that they will die, that they, if you want, death was decreed upon them. There is another possibility that I think is true as well. And I think the Hebrew allows for both readings, and as does the Greek. And that is that if you remember, they had clothed themselves with coats, with fig leaves, with uh, plant leaves. And God clothed them with coats of skin. Now that was at a time period in the Garden of Eden when the animals didn't die. The animals weren't dying. So for God to have animal skins, he had to kill something. And there is absolutely no way I can prove this except to make a statement from the scope of Scripture that if I were God and what happened with Adam and Eve was a primal type of what was going to happen with mankind and the Savior, if I were God, I would have that day killed an animal like a lamb and used that skin to clothe Adam and Eve. Do I personally believe that something died that day? Yes, I do. I believe it was a lamb or maybe several lambs and that the skins were used to clothe Adam and Eve at a time when animals weren't dying of old age or of disease. And then, of course, the Hebrew also allows in a kind of uh, a double entendre or amphibologia that then also they were decreed to die, which, of course, they did. And now, of course, the way through to, to get everlasting life is through the Savior, Jesus Christ. So I wanted to, I wanted to lay that out and uh, put that in front of us for discussion and for consideration, because as we're talking about the gift of spirit and, and uh, us being born of body and soul and then getting born again and being given the gift of Holy Spirit, it's important in the, in the scope of scripture to understand kind of our ancestry, where we've come from and, and what has happened as a result, and particularly to better understand created and made and formed. So at that point, I am happy as a clam to open the, the floor for all kinds of discussions and thank you for your attention.